Warning, this entry is intended for members of the Chair and Special Committee Icarus only. Any and all reports regarding P-12 are to be restricted and directed to Special Committee Icarus for registration. The following is a top secret document addressed to heads of state and their respective secretaries concerned with national security. Official statement by the Regulatory Board of Rift-Related Activity. To all it may concern, in this statement, the chair of the Association of Ishtar intends to address questions and concerns raised by various parties regarding P-12. For brevity, we'll answer some of the frequently raised concerns in the following four points. Is P-12 preternatural in nature? The answer is yes. Can and must P-12 be intercepted? The answer is no. Is P-12 a threat? The answer? Possibly. Has the association devised any defense measures to stop P-12? The answer is again, no. Despite its mundane appearance, that being a white zeppelin, P-12 is a sentient entity with defensive and offensive capabilities unrivaled by known human military, on this plane or elsewhere. Ignoring it is, until adequate measures have been developed, the most reasonable course of action. Up till now, P-12 has only been aggressive when provoked, like in the case of the Sesame Coastal Battery that got destroyed in 1869. See the excerpt P-12-C attached to this letter. In that regard, P-12 is not a direct threat, but because it ignored all past attempts to communicate, its origin or motivations can't be ascertained. To demonstrate its known offensive abilities, we have included a synopsis of Incident P-12-C on the Anatolian coast. Attachment P-12-C on the 17th of February, 1869, the coastal town of Sesma was woken up by a loud impact that devastated a nearby gun emplacement. When authorities arrived to investigate, the entire area, about 100 feet in diameter, was entirely crushed, as if it was struck by an enormous hammer. Without any obvious signs of detonation, the ground within the 100 feet area had lowered almost 2 feet under the force of the impact. Witnesses from Sesma and crew members of a not-to-be-disclosed naval vessel have stated seeing a pristine white zeppelin, without markings, passing the coast in a southern direction. No party has claimed responsibility for the destruction of the fortifications. This is Sesma Ottoman Coast Guard to unidentified air vessel. You ignored our signals. Please change course now or you will be fired upon. This is Esma Ottoman Coast Guard to unidentified air vessel. You're entering Ottoman airspace. Please turn back or you'll be fired upon. At this point, there is still no response from the White Zeppelin. The officer in charge orders a warning shot in the direction of the air vessel. Unidentified air vessel, this is your last warning. Adjust your course now. There is still no response and the anti-aircraft battery opens fire on the Zeppelin. Impact on... Nothing happened. No effect. No effect. Target is still approaching. Wait, I see something emerging from the starboard bow. What follows is legible. This is presumably the observation post getting crushed. There are no further transmissions. Addendum. The White Zeppelin has been sighted by various countries since 1863. There are no reports of the vessel mooring anywhere or traveling in the direction of a particular destination. Warning. This entry is intended for members of the Chair and Special Committee Icarus only. Any and all reports regarding P-12 are to be restricted and directed to Special Committee Icarus for registration. The following record is derived from a report by Associate 176, who is stationed in Arcology for a prolonged time to observe the events taking place there and investigate the various phenomena surrounding the settlement. In one of his reports, he writes about a white zeppelin that moors regularly at Elysium.
I've given up on trying to assimilate within the local population. One does not simply adapt to a culture foreign to one's own, let alone one in a city created by refugees from various planes of existence who, at first glance, only have their humanity in common. Or so I used to believe. Despite my month-long stay in Arcology, I was not one of them. I didn't even feel a proper connection with those who stayed here shorter than I did. After all, I still had a home to return to. Would something happen to Arcology, I could return to Atlas. And like them, would be doomed to succumb to Traveler's Decay should they ever leave this place. It gave me a sense of superiority in a way. As do most tourists, scientists and traders who, like myself, can travel here thanks to a silver ticket. I'd find it easier to talk with them because we are all travelers. We talk about the state of near anarchy, the filth, the fact their food looks like it could eat them instead and at any given moment. Surely no decent humans could live like this. I would tell myself, it wouldn't be the same for me as it is for them. After all, they are but scavengers, living of alien creatures no civilized person would think to look at, let alone touch. They pillage the ruins of a once greater civilization like a bunch of grave robbers. To most, arcology is nothing but a slum, filled with the unwashed immigrants who should feel lucky just to be alive. That those who end up in arcology couldn't imagine living anywhere else. But one day, while walking by a saloon, I noticed a tall, muscular man sitting at a table. His face was scarred, as if a clouder of cats had a field day with it. Blankly, he stared at the glass he was holding in his hand, as if he was hypnotized by it. Beside him, leaning against the wall, stood an alien device that was even exotic for the standards of arcology. It looked like a rifle, but was loaded with a stripper clip mounted with pristine looking needles the size of crossbow bolts. He must have been a collector. The scavenger elite, who make up the top of the hierarchy in terms of skill and equipment. They go deeper into the rings of Hades than any other and bring back objects which would take a scientist back home a lifetime to understand. And they wear these items like trophies, or mask their use in their own peculiar way. To common people, these would appear as alien and as monstrous like the outsiders they hunt for food. They're proud of their craft and status. Each one of them probably has their own sets of legends. Yet, there he sat alone making counterclockwise motions with his hand while staring at the twirling liquid contained inside the glass. It seemed like the vortex hypnotized him, invoking dark thoughts in his mind. A darkness which he then projected into me as I stared at his face. What I saw in his blank, hopeless expression was not the ignorant suffering of some drunkard. He knew just as well as I what was happening to him, and his morbid state of limbo. But unlike purgatory, at the end of his days no paradise awaited him. Just oblivion. I wonder now, as I did then, how does one end up like this? I decided I needed to start at the beginning of the transition. And there is one place where all inhabitants set foot in this place for the first time. So today I visited the station. Curious to see the new arrivals disembark and observe their reactions to their new living environment. The harbor area called the station is enormous. The interior of that place is believed to run all the way from the lowest decks of Hades up to the unexplored command decks. The ancient ships once docked here are gone, or their wrecks are lodged somewhere in the lower decks. There are generators leaking lethal levels of radiation. Suffice to say, few dare to venture to the bottom. Most of the bridges and docking galleries have been turned to ruin or have been picked clean by scavengers. All that remains now 
are a large and a small terminal. The small one is for the botches, which can fit a dozen or people or so, and is uncommonly used. Arrivals, on the other hand, can process hundreds, some say up to a thousand new arrivals. Radio Retro Future made the announcement in the morning that new refugees were about to arrive. A natural disaster had made life almost impossible in a matter of moments. These wretches would be the last survivors chosen to come here. When the announcement was done, a small group of people made their way to the station. But not to welcome, just to observe. I followed them up to the causeway overlooking the terminal. It was empty. Not a single person awaited them. Not even a single representative. Without warning, the plating on the foot shook as a deep screeching vibrated through the entire station. The hellish sound of a whale's death cry hurt my eardrums as the outer hull plating separated, exposing us to the ether outside. A white zeppelin, over 400 feet in length, passed the gate in eerie silence. Its propellers turned slowly as it glided in like a funeral ship, omnipresent and foreboding. The scavengers around me observed the sight in silent reverence. Or horror, it was hard to tell the difference. Although it seemed unlikely, looking at them now, all of them arrived in that awe-inspiring ship. A vessel so splendidly in its simplicity it would inspire envy in kings. The gondola looked as robust as a train locomotive, but was designed with the delicate touch of an artist. But despite all that splendor, all knew that everyone inside that wonderful, pristine-looking gondola was equal. Everything that mattered to them not so long ago, status, relationships, prosperity, their past, their future, hope, it was all gone. They were equal in misery, laws, and filled with painful memories of a world vanquished. The knowledge that the societies ever existed would die with them, eventually. All that awaited the passengers now was Hades. Ironically, if life itself mattered, the best outcome they could have hoped for. The White Zeppelin slowed down as the humanoid figures exited the gondola and walked down the causeway to start the docking procedure. The masked crewmen, dressed in white, moored the ship in silence. Instead of a uniform, they wore a loosely fitted shirt and trousers, resembling something more akin to robes, and performed their duties in a ritualistic manner, wilder than the crude custom you expect from dock workers. These were the servants of Out, I was told. What this Out being was, nobody claimed to know or understand. They all pronounced its name as it hurt them to say it, like they just bumped their head when mentioning the word Out. Even if I write this, its name inspires dread in me, like a fear passed down to me from my ancestors. How fitting these servants serve as the ferryman. The plank was lowered onto the platform, and finally, the first passengers left the ship, looking like miners emerging from the underground. Whatever ended their world, they were all covered in suit. Rich, poor, pale, black, they all had the expressions of frightened children being pushed into the unknown. Some noticed us, noticed us standing on the causeway, and looked at us with despair, probably wondering if we were friends or would be masters, while the growing flock pushed them on ever forward. It was not the same for them as it was for me. I came here, looking forward to discovering what countless generations before me wanted to know. What happened inside Elysium? Even now, while I stopped calling it Elysium, I observed this world with curiosity. But to them, is it hope? If they would be given the chance to return to their blasted world, would they take it? As if in a trance, I observed the final refugees leaving the ship, and the terminal emptied 
but a single woman stayed behind on the platform. She was small, even made tinier by the ill-fitting suit covered clothes. She stood there, frozen like she was incapable of moving. Just as I wondered if she needed any help, all the other spectators turned their back to the ship and walked away. One of them stopped and laid his hand on my shoulders. Don't worry about it, lad, he said with a growling but gentle voice. There is always one. Then he too walked away. But I stayed, wondering what was happening to her. Nobody cared. Not even the crewmen gave her any attention like she was an empty vessel. I lost track of time as I absorbed the poor lass. Then her luggage just dropped to the floor and she turned around. Her body swayed with every step as if she was under a spell and ascended the plank into the ship. I stayed to see if she would be thrown out. Instead, one of the crew walked up to the left luggage, picked it up, walked up to the side of the platform and threw it into the depths of the station. And with that, every trace of her was gone. The crew boarded the vessel, and after they pulled in the plank, finally the white zeppelin left as silently as it arrived.